I'd just like to thank everybody for attending today and uh, I'd like to acknowledge the relevant funding bodies. So the CRCNA, GRDC, Queensland Government, Northern Territory Government, Department of Primary Industries and Regional Development of Western Australia, uh, the Federal Australian Government, Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources, and the Business Cooperative Research Centres Program. And as well, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Savannah Ag Consulting, Tony Machette for all his phenomenally hard work over the past few years. So just a brief recap of what's happened since last time Tony presented. Uh, at Tony's request, uh, the project lead was transferred from Savannah Ag to Pharmacist Proprietary Limited. Uh, the question is, who is Pharmacist? I suppose not everybody would have heard of us. So we're a private agronomic solutions provider. So we work across a different variety of crops, including bananas. We're moving into tea tree. We've done work in macadamias. Uh, with rice. A lot of our work, however, is based in sugarcane, and we can really see that there's a good fit for this oil seed industry in the sugarcane fallow periods. So that's why we're quite interested in uh, moving into this project. Uh, if you have further information on pharmacists, you can see our web address there. But I'd just really like to take the time to fully acknowledge Tony Machette from Savannah Ag for all his hard work. As you can see, as we go through the winter and spring, winter and spring 2020 program, he really did a lot of work. There's a lovely photo of Tony there with his trademark smiley sunflower. So the way I'm going to go over that is, is provide you an overview of what trials were done for the individual season and then provide outcomes of the individual seasons and then a bit of a look at what we've got happening at the moment for 2020-21 summer trial work and then obviously look at what we're planning for the 21 winter trial work. And down the bottom there is an EC map. We do a lot of precision agriculture in pharmacists. And that's an EC map of our 2021 winter trial site with a border around it. So in 2020, Tony applied trials at one location in Bubuara in far north Queensland. It was coming out of a sugarcane rotation and it was the farmer was entering into a long-term fallow. More and more farmers within the sugarcane system are getting into the long-term fallow because there is uh, cash benefits. Obviously, that's where the oil seeds fit in, but also to the associated soil health benefits for the successive sugarcane crops. So a lot of the blokes getting into these alternative, oh, sorry, long-term fallows are seeing substantial increases in cane yields. Nick, sorry, can I just interrupt you there? We're just having some technical issues. Do you mind just with your microphone that you're using, maybe just lift it up a little bit to speak into? Thank yeah. you. Is that better? Yes. No worries. I'm sorry about that. No, that's okay. Okay. So, yep. Uh, this place of Babura went into a sugar cane going into a long-term fallow cropping rotation. So in 2020, Tony did a bucket load of work, as you can see here. He did camelina of uh, evaluating 40 varieties at three times of sowing. There was evaluation of nigella. Uh, safflower, he did a fair bit of agronomy work on the safflower previously, but he was looking to investigate the impact of time of sowing, three different times of sowing. Uh, if you look at the JDC grow notes, they've identified uh, a May planting is suitable. So Tony's really pushed the boundaries by sowing it in April. Linseed, evaluating the different varieties to see how well they're going to grow in the northern Queensland situation. Fenugreek, generally for increasing the seeds, but also to see how it grew within the region. Indian mustard, a time of sowing by three um, on one variety. And canola, it was 16 varieties at four replicates. So it's a massive trial. But looking to see how canola varieties would grow in the northern region. And carinata, a similar sort of outcome. And that's one of Tony's lovely trial sites. All nice and green and neat. So... In the 2020, 2020 winter trials, the crop observations were irrigation. Irrigation was a biggie. Although it's um, post the summer wet and there should be stored soil moisture, a lot of these crops really did require good irrigation to achieve outcomes. So via the furrow irrigation, there was issues with water moving into the beds where he negate or address that issue by putting in tape irrigation 
the impact of the watering then negated the impact of time of sowing three treatments. Across the trial site there, there was different types of soils and with different water holding capacities. So that impacted upon trial outcomes as well. So growth was really impacted by soil type and water holding capacity. With some of these new crops, uh, there's also two impacts of residual herbicides from within the cane rotation. So you can see here at the bottom photo, uh, this is camelina and the same variety, but the impact of residual herbicide on one side of the bed. Um, looking back at the farmer's records, it would seem that it was flame that was basically hindering the growth and establishment of the crop. Also too, temperature and moisture stress impact upon the pest pressure in the brassicas, specifically for the canola. So aphids were a bit of a problem. And as you can see by this lovely photo here. So the outcomes of the trials, the linseed was well and truly impacted upon by the soil type and the irrigation efficiency. And there was issues with the seed quality and that impacted upon plant establishment. Uh, looking at the little graph down the bottom here, it's not representative of the individual variety's performance, it's more representative of their location on the trial site with regards to the irrigation efficiency. However, his observations that came out of the trial were an early sowing provided better outcomes. If you went in with a higher density planting in full irrigation, you'd get better yields, but obviously irrigation and rainfalls are consideration so maybe along the coast could have been a better option. And what varieties you selected would be what the market was dictating. With a lot of these oil seeds, different varieties, they have different purposes or different demands across the markets. So you might want to think about what variety you're going to plant and how saleable it is. Out of his safflower, once again, there was issues with the irrigation efficiency due to soil type. An earlier sowing uh, produced increased total dry matter. And so an April planting was the best time of sowing. There's the one main variety of uh, safflower within these trials at the moment, which is a higher lake variety provided by Go Resources, which is primarily looking to be used for industrial lubricants for extremely fine um, uh, industrial applications. Maybe industrial is not the right word, but uh, it can be used in pacemakers, so it's a high value oil, but they're looking to bring out a different variety with a higher lake oil content. So different varieties might have a better regional fit. Um, and also too, obviously as irrigation is an issue or a strong consideration, time to maturity is a big factor as well too. So by manipulating irrigations, can you increase or decrease the time to maturity? For the camelina, the time of sowing demonstrated a limited impact upon total dry matter. So that was a flexibility of planting date. So within the cane system, a harvest occurs over a fair period of time or people might be coming out of soybeans and looking to plant later in the year. So the camelina might have a good fit due to its flexibility of time of sowing. However, saying that camelina tonies achieved the seed from the Australian seed bank. So there's older varieties sitting there and not much is really known about the agronomy required to grow it. So the full agronomic package would need to be developed to fully maximize the outcomes for it. And that includes, you know, the water requirements, nutrition, herbicide plant back period, as you saw by the previous photo and the seeding rates. So further variety trials. So Tony's managed to retain seed from these trials. Um, and so different varieties need to be targeted and also to confirm time of sowing observations. So the Indian mustard, it's a very interesting one. The man who from Sydney University who's been providing it, the seed, he's extremely passionate about Indian mustard due to its tolerance to dry conditions. Um, it's mainly being planted around Narrabri at the moment. So He's provided seed for the North Queensland trials very kindly, and he's providing different genetics, but obviously due to its tolerance to dry conditions, it could have a really good fit for the winter cane fallows. So obviously there was an impact of time of sowing upon yield and pest pressure. So the later in the season it was planted, the more water stress it went under and the impact of pests uh, targeting the weaker crops was noted. And as you can see by the graph here, 
uh, the earlier time of sowing, mid-April roughly, achieved much more kilograms per hectare of seed. So the recommendations, more genetics required, and this year's trials will be trialling different genetics. Target in April, May planting. Well, that's as per what Sydney University recommends. It really needs to go on that April, early May planting sowing window. Need to further you know, muck around with the irrigation and the water use efficiencies to determine um, what levels of irrigation do need to be applied to maximise the outcomes, or if you can still achieve an economic yield on no irrigations. Effective in-crop monitoring needs to be done to keep an eye on the, uh, the pests and the diseases, just to ensure that you do achieve um, full yield outcomes. And an interesting factor of the Indian mustard and also to the Carinata is biofumigation. Not much work has been done investigating uh, how they impact upon soil pathogens such as Pachymetra, uh, which is a big problem within the sugarcane industry. So the soil health benefits could be quantified. So under the massive Carinata trial that Tony was doing, once again, the same as Indian mustard, they're both brassicas, it's tolerant to dry conditions. It demonstrated reduced pest pressure. So it had a really good fit for Northern, far North Queensland. But looking at the different varieties that were provided here, and maybe on the screen, it's a bit small to see, but you can see between some of the varieties, there were significant differences in yields. Uh, this year, they're looking to further provide different varieties for the winter trials that uh, demonstrate further drought tolerance. So they're looking for further variety trials. Uh, well, that's the recommendations out of Tony's work. They'd like to see further variety trials, uh, further fine tune the water use efficiency, and again, quantify the biofumigation effects. So the Nigella was interesting, but it did have a high demand for water. So if you're looking for a low cost crop to go into your sugarcane fallow, um, obviously the cost of irrigation is a factor that needs to be uh, considered. Some of the previous trial work that Tony did with regards to um, weed control, it worked quite well. So there's some uh, pesticide application, oh, sorry, herbicide applications in with the APVMA for this. It displayed limited pest pressure, it grew well in farther north Queensland, um, and some of the different varieties that he trialled, they worked very well. Interesting again, though, um, you can see the dip in the crop uh, due to the far irrigation. So it does have a high water demand and the subbing in from the from the sides of the furrows was an issue. So obviously as it worked well, um, Tony recommended pre-commercial trials combined with previous agronomic work to ensure that you get maximum yields for the inputs. So the fenugreek was primarily just to look over the fence as well as achieving further seed. So it worked well, it grew extremely well. There was limited insect pesa, pressure, I'm sorry, but powdery mildew was a problem. So you've got to monitor it for the fungal issues as well as the pry fungicides at the key times. Uh, but one issue that was noted was that due to the stature of the crop, it was very hard to harvest it effectively. So Tony recommended that time of sowing, changing and mucking around with the times of sowing would possibly an impact, of, sorry, a, a method of impacting upon the plant physiology and increasing the height of the crop so it could be effectively harvested. So looking at his 2020 spring trial work, it was spread over two locations. Once again, Bibua, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, and Mount Sheridan south of Cairns. So uh, the Bibua site is obviously in the African Tablelands, got an irrigation furrow on the tape, but the Mount Sheridan site south of Cairns was a rain-fed cane system. So it was primarily commercial and pre-commercial work there, looking at black sesame, safflower and, safflower and sunflower. And so the black sesame is quite an exciting oil seed for the Australian market because it can be harvested via commercial harvesters. Uh, sesame traditionally grown is required to be hand-picked. So obviously Australians, the Australian market can't compete with it. Say so places like India where they can afford to employ people to pick it by hand. But the black sesame being non-shattering, you can go with a commercial harvester and uh, reduce the cost for the labour component. With the safflower, Tony was uh, really pushing the boundaries by a spring planting, uh, totally under rain-fed conditions. Just wanted to sort of see 
if it could have a fit in that sort of time frame as well, because there really hasn't been any work in Northern Queensland upon that time of planning. And Sunflower, a crop evaluation for that one variety, uh, Barenberg Aussie Clear 20, um, because it's fast maturing. So you wouldn't, you could plant it in spring or late winter, and it would be ready to be harvested prior to the wet season kicking in, as well as it had clear field technology. So you, you could actually go through with different forms of herbicides and reduce weed pressure upon the next crops. So in the black sesame, the, the only issue really was for, from pests was uh, the leaf webber larvae. And you can see here some pictures of the leaf webber, webber larvae rolling the leaves. There was a little bit of pressure from the aphids, but not much, but something that might want to be monitored in the future. Uh, also to the helicoprovera, helicoprovera, sorry, limited pressure there as well. And the yield's 1.3 tonnes per hectare, not a bad outcome. So time of sowing, manipulating <clears throat> yields could be a good, a good option for future work. Mucking around with the nutrition, obviously a good option. And uh, can you improve the yields by supplementary irrigation? Um, a big factor too with nutrition for all these trials going on the coastline is that there will be regulations put in place at least by the end of next year, determining how much nitrogen oh, oh, yeah. can be applied. Yeah. Yeah, well, I can't leave there. So uh, a lot of these trials where nutrition for the nutritional work is recommended, it's going to be um, a legal requirement of applying the, the appropriate rates of uh, fertilizer and not just a suck it and see approach. So with this safflower, uh, what he found there was it had the ability to be sown at greater depths so you could actually seek moisture. So because it was put in that... Uh, the can site with um, supplement, uh, with only looking for rainfall, there was limited soil moisture at the surface, so they had to plant it deeper, but the safflower harvested it all right and uh, merged all right. Really wasn't much in the way of pest pressure. It grew well on limited water. However, as discussed previously, the later yield, uh, reduced yields due to the spring planting or the later planting. So the big one that came out of that was keep the April planting to achieve maximum yields. And there's a, although not from that particular site, he's one of the growers, pharmacist growers in the Mackay region in his safflower crop. So with the sunflower, uh, limited weed or disease pressures, uh, yield, however, the yield was impacted upon by insects or rather gland bug and birds. So the cockatoos gave it a bit of a hammering. Harvesting equipment problem was you require dedicated harvester fronts for harvesting sunflowers effectively. And that might be an issue moving forward for industry or people looking to grow it up there, not having access to the appropriate harvesting equipment. But saying that, it grew well for the region. So recommendations, obviously in-crop pest monitoring, followed by control measures, specifically referring to the rather gland bug there. And obviously as discussed previously, the harvesting equipment, it's required for commercial harvest. No point planning it if you can't get it off appropriately. And where we're up to at the moment. So we have gone in with soybean trials, obviously, because it's well suited for the summer conditions in, within the cane system due to the uh, established beds, planting on the beds so it can withstand the pressures of the wet season. Not that we've had much of a wet season down here in Mackay at the moment. But saying that, we have trials up there in Lakeland at the moment. Oh, sorry, look, that should be Lakeland. I'm sorry, not Laura, my mistake. But we've got uh, eight different varieties looking to see what the best varietal fit for that particular far north region will be. Uh, that also too includes a new experimental variety. In the Burdekin, we have a time of sowing by five varieties. So the time of sowing before Christmas and uh, in a late January sowing as well too. In that trial, there's two established varieties, Coranda and Hayman, as well as three experimental varieties. And that's looking to see, obviously, the impact of time of sowing upon yield outcomes, but also to looking at the shorter season experimental varieties and to see if they can replace uh, A6785 because there was disease issues. It's very handy within the Burdekin system because it's a slow, sorry, a very quick maturing, maturity variety. However... Uh, obviously it was hammered by the diseases in previous years. So these new experimental varieties could be a really good fit. 
And in Mackay, we've gone for a seeding density by four varieties at four sowing rates trial to determine, because there's not much agronomic knowledge about soybean varieties for the central region or the Burdekin region. So this is to see, uh, sorry, to provide a start for a good agronomy package for growers in the region to determine, you know, what's the best sowing rate for your varieties uh, with the potential plans for future trial work, looking at uh, row spacing, um, nutrition, pest, weed control, those sorts of things. Something to note as well too about this, these current trials we're moving into, um, a lot of it was based upon grower requests and grower needs for the individual regions. So it's not just something we decided we were going to do, but it was uh, an industry need across the across Northern Queensland. So just looking at Mackay here, so just up here in the top corner, all the trials this year, are, well, the summer soybean trials are fully replicated uh, trials designed by the statisticians at DAF. So a big thank you to them for all their assistance and get it happening. So uh, in the Mackay soybean trial, we've got Coranda, Mossman, Eubunya, and Leichhardt. Leichhardt's an old variety, but it's been compared with these newer varieties because it's a benchmark for this region. We went at 200,000, 250,000, 300,000, and 350,000 seeds per hectare uh, to determine the impact upon diseases and basically in the end yield, because yield is king. So monitoring, we're doing in-crop observations weekly, uh, R1 and R5 biomass to determine if there's a correlation between biomass and yield at those times. And as well at harvest, we're looking at yield, oil and protein. Another benefit also to the, uh, the biomass being conducted at the R1 and the R5 is obviously if you get a failed crop, you do say a grub infestation and you can't spray it. Biomass is a big component of, uh, you know, reducing your nitrogen requirements for the successive crops. So seed density is a big factor in that as well too. And there's obviously some pictures of one of our CSCNA field days that we held recently. There's myself, another co-worker, and you might not be able to see, that's the uh, sign acknowledging the funding bodies and, it, and there's people at the field day. And that's a lovely drone shot showing the different uh, plots with the different varieties in it. So at the moment, I've only got really data for the R1 biomass outcomes, but looking at Coranda, it was interesting. There was a general decrease in average dry biomass tons per hectare and total crop nitrogen content with increasing sowing rate. So with a grower, if you planted 200,000 seeds per hectare, you'd be reducing your costs, but also too, you would have a increased biomass and uh, more nitrogen for the following crop and also to potentially more yield. Like heart, it was all over the shop. So once again, you could reduce your costs by putting it in the lower sowing rate. Mossman, it... Uh, there was an increase in dry biomass and crop nitrogen content up until 300,000 seeds per hectare. And then once you hit that, it all fell off from the 350,000 seeds per hectare. So that might be the sweet spot for that variety. And New Bunya, as would be expected, because it's only a small crop, uh, the more you planted, up to 350,000 seeds, biomass increased, and so did the crop end content. So just to clarify too, when we're talking about calculating the crop end content, that was... Uh, identified via the biomass and also to the Sugar Research Australia Six Easy Steps Toolbox Legume Nitrogen Content Calculator. So what are we looking to do in 2021 winter cropping? Um, I don't know because it's a lot of work looking at all the places. But anyway, um, you can see the sites where we're looking to put things in. So we've got pre-commercial trials at the same sites as we've got the soybean sites. So we're aiming for Lakeland, definitely Burdekin and Mackay. And we've picked the eyes out of Tony's previous work. And so we've consulted very heavily with Tony as to what we think the winners are and they're fit for within the sugarcane extended fallow systems. So safflower, carinata and Indian mustard, one variety of each. And we're going to be investigating the impact of environment and genetics upon yield. So the same varieties, same trials, obviously different trial designs, at Lakeland, Burdekin and Mackay. Uh, we'll be monitoring soil moisture down to 1.2 metres, uh, full char characterisation of the site before to sowing, in crop monitoring, weather station on site, uh, as well as harvesting. The method of harvest is yet to be determined, but we're looking to do it in a statistically sound manner so as we can achieve some good data. And then as well too, we've got the commercial trials in two locations 
And we're adding a new one this year to Beliando, which is near Charters Towers. And one up at Laura or Olivevale Station where there's been previous oil seed work conducted. And so we're looking to determine, you know, how much yield one can get in safflower on stored soil moisture. So the Beliando site, they, it's primarily cattle, but they do have an extensive area of cropping as well. And there is other cropping regions out there. So if you can demonstrate that these, you know, dry land suitable crops have a good place that can extend cropping into that region uh, and the same sort of uh, philosophy or goal for Laura as well. And that's it to, from me. So that's us within our trial site here in Mackay. Uh, if, if there's any questions, I'm happy to address them or if I'm not able to, please don't hesitate to send me a, an email at that particular email address. Um, yeah, happy to take questions. Okay, let's thanks Nick. That was great. Um, Thank you. Does anyone have any questions that they want to drop into the Q and A, or maybe you can unmute and ask yourself, I guess, if you like. Um, cool. It's nice when you do a presentation, and it's so good that nobody needs to ask any questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, if anyone um, digests that and has some questions to follow up on, um, happy for them to be through uh, email. Oh, hang on, Cara's got one, sorry. Uh, Cara Klepper from GRDC has said, great, Nick, can you comment on marketability of these crops you are looking at further? So marketability, that was one of the big components of Tony's previous trial work. Um, one of the big issues that we do face here is competing with overseas markets. So some of the work that Tony found previously was um, the linseed, for example, that was hard to market. There really wasn't that much interest in it. Some of the other ones are more niche market, like for example, the Nigella or the Camelina. So from our perspective as an organization, we haven't gone down that path in the project. So we've changed the project specifications, but also to saying that that's why we're focusing upon um, the Indian mustard, the carinata and the safflower. So the carinata um, is with new seed and that is a new product to Australia because it's looking to be sold uh, for crushing for biofuels to achieve carbon credits overseas. So one, we're looking to establish that this stuff can be grown. It fits within the sugarcane system. There's a demand for it. And then New Seed then is looking to establish the path to market because that's they own the rights to the seed. The safflower itself, that it being a higher lake oil, the organisation that owns the genotype for that, Go Resources are very interested in developing it and getting more people to grow it. But saying that, that is one of the big issues that we have here in far north Queensland is infrastructure so that developing the market ourselves is beyond the capacity of this particular project um, our big thing is that we know we there is money value for it as long as we can demonstrate that it can be grown appropriately and get the best yields possible so for example um safflower in the Mackay region the closest processing plant in, is in Kingaroy, that'll crush it for Go Resources. So as long as you can get the appropriate yields, you can then reduce the cost of transport and then get your maximum dollar back. So path to market, that's outside our current scope of the project. But saying that as long as we can maximize agronomy and find the best, ship, best fit for the sugarcane system, people are looking to grow it and willing to grow it. An interesting observation as well, though, we've sourced Sirenaceae safflower seed for the commercial trials this year and with a good germination rate. And it's very hard to source non high lake variety safflower seed. We have entered into tentative discussion about supplying that safflower seed for bird seed. And that's interestingly worth $250 a tonne more than the high lake variety for the industrial purposes. So these things are worth money as long as you can provide a good crop 
and good yields. Very interesting. Um, Marie Vitelli from Ag Forces asked, did fall armyworm appear in any of the oilseed trial crops? And if yes, was productivity damage minimal? No, actually we uh, attended one of Tony's uh, field days up there at Mariba um, and he had a broad, broad, broad uh, variety of crops in there, including um, uh, May, uh, millet, sorry, uh, as well as all the different oilseed crops. Uh, the, fall, the fall army worm was found in the millet, but none of the oil seed crops were affected. So maybe the millet was acting as a trap crop, but from the observations that were done over the uh, 2020 winter and spring trials, there was no fall army worm damage observed. Also too, at that photo of the grower in Mackay holding the safflower, he had sorghum in the next paddock. Uh, the sorghum was affected by the fall army worm, but the safflower wasn't touched. Yeah, right. So if anybody's walked through a paddock of safflower, I think you'll understand why. Very spiky. Mm. Uh, Kara's asked another question as well. Um, what is the crop protection package for these crops and are there adequate product registrations available? That's one of the issues. Say, for example, with sesame. Uh, so under the previous work that Tony's done with the sesame seed, he is applied to the APVMA for particular herbicide applications. So yes, there definitely needs to be more work done upon what crops you can, uh, what pesticides and herbicides you can legally apply on these crops. So a package does need to be developed out of it, and that's some of the pre that's the outcomes of the previous work that Tony's done with his trials. Great. Uh, I don't think we've got any more questions. Sounds like it's exciting work, a bit of trial and error, but there's still lots of work to be done beyond this project as well. So definitely, definitely. So our, yeah. our big focus at the moment is there's a lot of growers out there who are looking to go into the extended fallows within our area of influence. Um, these are a great fit for the extended sugar cane fallows. Um, some blokes have extended it out for two years. So that's a great, mm. uh, a great message for the oilseed industry, really. Yeah. Um, and also to the farmers are seeing the benefits of including these alternative crops within the extended fallow economically. Excellent. Uh, sorry, we just have one last question coming from Tracy. Uh, did you did you mention some crop seed going overseas for biodiesel? And can you tell us more about that? Yeah, sure. Um, the best man to speak to about the whole package is Brent Whittaker from uh, New Seed. So he's the, the project lead for that particular aspect of Carinata. But to give a brief overview is that if Carinata can be grown under particular conditions, and that being one, it's not disrupting or disturbing a food source, and the other one is if it's, you, if it's grown with uh, nutrients not sourced from commercial fertilizers, for example, compost or mill mud, when it is sold, you can achieve a very high um, carbon credit price. And so therefore this oil they're looking to send overseas for processing in Europe, I'm fairly certain, or America um, for, for biodiesel for vehicles as well as producing high quality jet fuels so they're seeing as having uh, as carinata is replacing traditional uh, petroleum fuels into the future so they've done a lot of work with it in america south america um, and i think there's been work done in europe on it as well too so they're looking now at just really sort of trying to ramp up get growers happening with the whole situation and um, demonstrating that they can really if there is enough demand, hopefully provide the crushing and the transport infrastructure. Okay, excellent. I am just cognizant of time. We went a little bit over setting up. So I think there isn't any more questions anyway. So um, there's another one come from Cara, but um, I'm just quickly answer this one. I think we might make this the last one then. Um, does pharmacists plan to do some economics? Yes. So, <coughs> excuse me. 
So, yeah. so yes, we're uh, some basic gross margin economics about what the cost to grow the crop was. Mm. So cost of inputs, uh, as well as the, how much your dollar return was, and that would include um, cost of transportation as well too. So pretty much the circle. So what a grower would want to know. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Well, we might call it, I think. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you so much, Nick, for your presentation and all your um, answers to those great questions there. Um, again, this will be on our website once we've sort of chopped and changed and got all the other webinar series together. It will be, it will be on our website. Um, yeah. Thanks a lot, Nick. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Thank you so much for your time and thank you everybody for attending. Thank you.